Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with us tonight? Just give the Lord whatever praise that comes truly from your heart tonight as we worship Him together.
live a strong spiritual life and have a walk with him. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We're going to take our knees before the Lord in this moment. If you have anything that you would like to make mention of, you can do that at this time. Anybody else? else have anything you want to mention? I know we need to remember Scott Barali, who um, had a heart attack and a stroke, and um, he is waiting on some tests to be ran for insurance purposes so that he can have some stents put in and so let's just pray that God will keep his hand of protection on him as he's in that waiting process and on his family give them peace and uh, comfort in this time of strength Um, pray that they wouldn't be overwhelmed with anxiety because I know that can be a stressful situation as well life is full of stresses sometimes and God is the peace in every storm that we face. And so I believe that he is going to work and move in these needs tonight. We have several needs on the screen. I believe they are all needs that we have been praying for. We will go ahead and continue to pray for those needs specifically. Um, Make sure you remember to pray for truth revelation for our community, for our prodigals. Pray for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost because... These are the things that people really need in life. They need healing, of course, but they need Jesus more than they need anything else. So let's pray for every person that you um, can think of in your own community, every person that you can think of that doesn't have God in their life or needs to come back to God. Let's make sure that we pray for those people. God is going to move in those situations. He's going to touch somebody's body in this place tonight. He's going to have his way in this place because we're going to be sensitive to his spirit and allow him to do that in this place tonight. Let's pray right now and take these needs before him. Lord, we worship you tonight. We thank you that we can come into this place together, God, and we can unify in prayer and we can come together and believe, God, that you are going to move in every need. Lord, I pray that you would touch these needs, God, that have been mentioned. Lord, I pray, God, for every person who needs healing in their body, Lord. I know that you took stripes for that healing right now, God, and I pray that you're going to move in that need, God, and I believe that you're going to work, Lord. I believe that you're going to perform the miraculous, God, for somebody tonight, Lord. You're going to move a mountain for somebody tonight, God. In the name of Jesus right now, God, I pray that you would just work, God, in every life. Every person that's here tonight, God, it's not by any mistake, Lord, but I pray right now, Lord, that you would just move in their heart tonight, God. I pray that when they leave here, God, that they would be different than when they came, God. I pray that they would be closer to you, Lord. I pray for there to be an outpouring of your spirit in our community, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you would bring back every prodigal, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, soften their hearts and make their eyes open up to you, Lord. Help them to want to come back to you, to desire it more than anything, God. In the name of Jesus, right now, Lord, I pray for our community, God, the lost people that is in it, Lord. I pray that you would just touch them tonight, God. Help them to believe in you, Lord. Help them to recognize who you are, Lord. In Jesus' name, God, bring them into this place, God. 
save their souls, Lord. In Jesus' name, use us by any means which you need to, God. In the name of Jesus, we worship you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your power and for your spirit, God. We thank you for going with us everywhere we go, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Share it with someone else this week in the name of Jesus. section of teaching, and the title of it is The Privilege of Joining the Body of Christ. Uh, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, to begin with, as we begin this lesson, <clears throat> verses 12 and 13, whereas the body is one has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. I want you to take note <clears throat> that the writer in 1 Corinthians, the 12th verse, or the 12th, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, I'm sorry. Verse 12, he talks about one body as having many members and all the members of that one body being many, being many are one body. So also is Christ. The writer and the teacher of this lesson talked about how that the body in reference to the body of Christ or the church, when they refer to the body of Christ, they're referring to the church because the church is the representation of the body of Christ. It has many members, and members in particular, just like my body, I've got five fingers on each hand, I've got five toes on each foot, got two eyes. You know, these are all different members of one body. Right. So the lesson commentaries in the earlier lessons was talking about a community. Now, when you think about a community, you're talking about, say, just for example, Puxico, the community is a large vast amount of people. Now, nothing like New York or San Francisco or anything like that, but it is a large community, many different people. We talked about, about the diversities of different people, the cultures, different people that were raised in a different culture. We talked about that in the earlier part of the lesson. But 
Paul is talking here in reference to the body or the church of the New Testament church. And he's using in the example, he is using that it's one body. There's not three or four bodies, one body running around here with one hand, another body running around here with uh, two eyes, but he says it's just one body. In other words, it's just one member, one body, one single body. Now, if the body of Christ, the church, becomes separated, becomes different, and begins to think and do things differently and say, this hand decided that it didn't want to be a hand, that it wanted to be a foot, and I all of a sudden had to walk on one hand and one foot and try and bring the foot up to be a hand, what would I have? Wouldn't I look kind of weird? Of course I would. It would be total chaos. It would be total mayhem. It would be crazy. There would be things that my one body couldn't perform, because I had a hand that wanted to be a foot and a foot that wanted to be a hand. So the writer was talking about one body. One body, but many members. And, you know, this has been taught many times, and you've read these verses in 1 Corinthians 12. many times, and we've talked about it many times, of how that all the members of the body in particular make up one body. All the members have to function as one body. They have to all work together. They all have to have one mind set. Now, when, just for an example, when we come into the house of the Lord on Wednesday night as we are here, we all come with one thing that we wanted to do, and that was worship the Lord. And then worship the Lord together, and hear the Word of God together, fellowship together, in unison, in, in uh, liberty, in, in, and in fellowship. And this lesson is going to get into uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, not not in biologically brother and sister, but in the Lord we become brothers and sisters and we become one mind, one uh, goal that is to win souls, that is to create a community of a church that would be one body but with one goal to worship God and give God all that we have in one body. Now, the commentary says a few things that are really interesting, such as when Jesus redeemed us from our sin, he does not leave us alone in, a, in our new life, isolated. We are baptized in the body of Christ, the believers around the world who are made one in the family of God. Now you think about that. Uh, all around the world, if, they, if they've been baptized into Jesus Christ, they are of one body. They are of one goal. They have one, one thing in mind. It is to win souls and serve God and worship Him. These are the examples that, that we look at when we look at the church in general. Now, we can look at our community church that we have now, and that's on a small scale. Not that I'm trying to say that we are a small church. I am saying this on the scale of a worldwide uh, Jesus name apostolic people. We are just one member of that large believers. But yet we all, even the church that is in uh, the Philippines, and we're in the United States of America, and we, we are one body. 
We are of one mind. We are to serve God collectively. Now, of course, in this passage, Paul compared the church to believers and worshipers of Jesus Christ to a human body. Of course, we've done mention that. The body has many parts that work together to carry out functions. In this body, Jesus Christ is the head. And we work together as he directs. Just as a body can't function without its parts, we need each other. And boy, is that not ever true. We need each other. Man, because I can't say to my hand, I don't need you, and cut it off and throw it in the trash. I can't say to my foot, I don't need you, cut it off and throw it away. I need that. Just the same way as to say that I need my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I cherish your fellowship. I cherish your uh, uniqueness, your, your abilities. I cherish your fellowship one with another. I cherish the time that we have when we come to the house of the Lord to worship Him in spirit and in truth, together, collectively as one. I cherish those things. I love God's people. I, I, I love them to the point that, you know, I consider them part of me. When I realize that when I think that one of them are, is in pain or one of them is having trouble, then, you know, I, I kind of consider I'm going to think on these things. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to help them in a way that, any way that I can because they are part of the body of Christ. Sickness, many times, and believe me, we hear, uh, we as ministers that they come up, people come up for prayer many times and we hear their need that they're asking God to take care of, there are many different needs that, that is presented to the ministry. They, they don't come up here and just say, well, I, I need healing because I've got a headache. I need healing because I've got a foot ache or I've got an earache or I've got, uh, you know, whatever their need may be. There are some that are kind of comical and one fellow in particular come up and had us to pray for his child to stop picking their nose. I kind of thought that was comical, but nonetheless we prayed. Well, whether that solved the issue or not, I do not know. But I believe that they were sincere. And I probably shouldn't have said anything about that, it being on mine. But there are many different needs that are presented to God because we all have confidence one in another. I have confidence, well, for example, morning prayer at 730, Brother Pastor Marty is there and he, he is faithful to this and many, many people give him needs to pray for and not just him, but everybody else that joins in, that signs on and don't sign on, but just listens. Many different ones are there, and they're praying. Believe me, I know, because I hear it every day. My wife hears it every day. She's so faithful in her prayer with Pastor Marty and all the others that come together to pray collectively as one. Now, I found out since Brother Marty's been doing this with the prayer, community prayer type thing, I found out that it works. It works. Because there's been many a time that people have signed in and gave their needs to the prayer team that, that is praying that day. And lo and behold, the next day they'll have a praise report. God did it. Thank you, prayer team, for praying for us. You see, many members, many members, but one body, one body. Amen. So the 
church is, is a family. Some churches maintain a tradition in which members are referred to as brother and sister. Well, we do this. Brother Steve, Brother Landon, Brother Marty, Sister Rebecca, Brother Ben, Brother, what's your name? I keep wanting to call him Matt. And it's Micah. I know it's Micah, but his dad is Matt, and I've known Matt all his life, and I've known Micah all his life, so I get him kind of kind of backwards. So you're all brothers and sisters to me. Now we weren't raised as children together in the same whole household. We were just simply grew up in a church that had one goal and had one mind that they were going to worship the Lord together collectively and they were going to see things happen in the community. So we, we recognize we all are joined together with God as our Heavenly Father. Bonds formed within the family of God are beautiful and woven together closely. We love, support, and care for one another through our highs and lows because we recognize God has joined us together as a family, and one day we will all worship God together in heaven. After all, this is our goal. This is what I've lived my life for to this point is to go to heaven. Now, when I'm getting ready to take my last breath, then I can look back on my life and say, this is what I've lived my life for this very moment, that when I lay down this walk of life, then I will know that I am ready to meet the Lord and that I will see my brothers and sisters on the other side worshiping the Lord in heaven. These are things that, uh, that we need to think about, we need to look at, and understand that God is always, always one. He understand he's one and many members make up him he uses you he uses you you're a member in particular you're not you know you may not be a hand you may not be an eye you may uh, physically you may not be any of these things but you are a member of the body of Christ yes, amen Paul's teaching, uh, I'm not going to go there and read it, but I've got one scripture out of Acts 15 and 1. Uh, Paul was teaching, or they were having an issue in that 15th chapter. Uh, they, there was Gentiles and Jews alike that were receiving the same Holy Ghost that was poured out on the day of Pentecost. And they were all there. They were receiving it. They were being baptized in Jesus' name. And some of these Jewish men uh, in the 15th chapter, we find that they were being, they, were, they had questions. Let me put it this way. They had some questions that can these Gentile people that have received the Holy Ghost and have been baptized in Jesus' name, can they actually be part of the church when they have not obeyed the Mosaic laws. Some of these laws, of the Mosaic laws, uh, obviously these men didn't understand about uh, Christ when he came, that he uh, made, he didn't do away with the law, but he made it more perfect. He improved on it, and he made it to where all men and women everywhere could be saved and could be part of the church in particular. So these men were discussing some things, and uh, in verse 1 of 15th chapter, it said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. That, that was a real harsh statement to me, it was. That would be like me saying, Okay, you, you've been baptized in Jesus' name, you've spoken tongues, you've done all these things, but until you learn the standards of the church, until you do exactly and you look a kick 
a cookie cutter look Pentecostal, you can't be saved. Is that, is that, does that sound harsh to you? I mean, I've, I've been in the ministry for many years, and, I, and I've been a father, I'm a grandfather, I'm a great-grandfather, and any of these babies, you know, when they're first born, I didn't kick them out of the crib and say, okay, now start walking. <laughs> you, be a, you be a grown up, you, you, I'm tired of this. You, you grow up now. You be what you're supposed to be down the road. You understand what I'm saying? The metaphor that I'm, I'm relating this to is you never, you can't clean a fish until you catch it. You can't tell somebody that's already got the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name. Now, okay, you get in here and you line up and you be perfect and you do everything that the Bible teaches you to do because they don't know these things are wrong yet. Well, I'm, I'm getting on to something here that really is not related, but I thought that the statement that these men made were really ignorant. Because these Gentiles, they already received the Holy Ghost. How do you get into the church of the living God? Well, the book of Acts, we find that the New Testament church, they were in an upper room, just 120. They were in an upper room, and they were just Jewish people. That is true. They received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It lit upon them like fire, and they began to speak in other tongues. But after that, they went out and they began to preach to other people and not just to the Jews. They went on out to the Gentile race of people. They went out there and they taught them about the Holy Ghost. They told them they could be saved. So for a man or a woman or somebody of this character that would go out and tell someone, well, until you are completely converted until you have uh, covered up all your unrighteousness, you cannot be saved. Let me tell you something. A person that is without conviction, a person that cannot be convicted by the word of God is someone that cannot be saved. How do you measure an individual You measure them, and please don't think I'm trying to judge anybody, but you measure an individual by their convictions that is trying to serve God. Now, there are some things that don't convict some people and some things that I'm convicted of that may not convict you. But your growth in God is when you can find a place in the Lord that you can grow and see how that God is not pleased with a certain thing in your life and you lay that down and say, well, whatever it takes to please God. Right. Now, I'm not talking about a dress code. I'm not, because all these things, indecency, ungodliness will come by conviction. Yes, when God begins to convict an individual's heart, then they begin to grow. And when they begin to grow, they see other things in their life. Let me tell you, you, you can measure your life in God by how much you feel convicted. Now, we can go a, a little deeper and talk about commitments, about the house of God and how we need to be there more often and as much as possible And we can talk about the love that we have one toward another because that reflects from the love that God has for his church. In St. John 15 and 13 said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Man, no greater love than that. Now don't ask me to go out here and stand in the middle of the road for you tonight and get run over and die for you. That's not what this means. 
This is referring to that Christ loved his church so much that he went to the cross and gave his life's blood. No greater love than that. Now let's talk about love for just a little while. I'm getting nowhere fast. But we need to talk about this. If you love, and you have you you got to have the love that God portrayed for, for his church. Now I want to get to this verse before I go on. I'm sorry. Hebrews 10, 25 said, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, it is important that we be in the house of God. Because when you're in the house of God, that is where you find fellowship and love one toward the other. Galatians 6 and 10 said, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are, are of the household of faith. Now here's an interesting verse. I know I'm kind of scatterbrained tonight and using what they call a shotgun. I'm just blowing it all out there. But in, in Luke, the sixth chapter and 31st verse, and as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also them likewise. That doesn't mean that if somebody does you evil, <laughs> that you're the first to turn around and do evil to them. That's not what that means. But that means that you're to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You would treat other people as you want to be treated. Amen. I'm telling you these things to portray this as the love of God and the community of the church gathering together as one. Because we're all of that spiritual body that is one. In, as we read earlier in the uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, the latter part of that verse, <clears throat> For by one Spirit are you all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free. And have been all made to drink into one body. Spirit. Now, he's using the example as drinking into the Spirit of God. And, you know, I, like I say, I've been in church a long, long time. I've been in a lot of different church services. And I can reference, I can relate to drinking into the Spirit of God, drinking into that one Spirit. Because, you know, you're out there and you're rubbing shoulders with the world. You're doing all, you're doing your typical daily use. You're doing all these things. And finally you get to go, time to go to church and you, you walk through those doors and it's just like a breath of fresh air. You feel the love of the saints of God. You feel the fellowship of the saints of God. And all of a sudden the Spirit of God just swoops in and you can just, Drink your feel of the presence of God. That's rejuvenating you. That's renewing you. That's, that's fulfilling you. That's helping you. Man, that's causing you to get up and, and be rejuvenated in the presence and in the, the Spirit of God. What if it was that all the church that we had was just maybe a Sunday morning and that was it. We couldn't come on Wednesday, didn't have Tuesday night prayer and, and none of these things was going on. And that's all we had. Can you imagine not being able to get into the, the worship and into the presence of God only just a few minutes out of a week? 
I can't imagine that. I can't imagine not being in the presence of God. I can't imagine. I mean, yeah, sure. I, I, we have the presence of God in our home. We have it, you know, when we're traveling. We have that when we're, we're working. We feel God. We know God's there. We feel after Him. We can drink of His Spirit. We can be all that we can be because God's there with us. But it's different when you come in and you can grab a hold of somebody's hand that in like passion that you have can worship and drink of that spirit of God. You know what I'm talking about. I see it in your eyes. I know you understand this. It's because we are in one spirit of Christ. The church collectively focusing on one thing, Christ. His church. You know, this is this is a good example. You know, you see many churches, and just like we have, you know, we've got a brand new building right over here. It's uh, the Prenzel Building, and it's in, we call it, first we call it the educational building, and and many children come in there and. The, Assistant pastor, when we was building it, I was so encouraged by what he said. He was, he just, we were just piddling around, working around, and he said, we're just going to fill this building up. Yeah. And I was so encouraged by that. I was so enthused by that. It made me want to really get together and really work and really uh, see something greater happen. Yeah. Because... When you get more than one mind collected together on one and focused on one thing, many great things can happen. You know, it doesn't have to be just the ministry that pray for those that are sick. Man, well, I've seen this happen many times in our services. I've seen individuals just say, I just... You know, I feel something. I feel like somebody needs prayer, and they'll go to somebody in particular, and they'll lay hands on them, or they'll pray for them, and victory will shout out every evil idea, every sickness, every pain, every agony, everything that's ever bothered. God will clear it all out just because some member of one spirit, of one mind, decided to obey God. We're in a powerful church. We're in a powerful church. We're, we're part of a church that nothing can stop. It's like a snowball rolling down a hill. It might start out small, but it ain't long till that snowball is rolling faster and faster and getting bigger and bigger and more enthusiastic and, and just begins to really cascade down that hill because Everybody is focused on one thing. Yes, sir. Revival in the community. Yes. Revival to souls that are hurting, that have pain, that have addiction, that have problems. They're all focused on one thing. That one spirit. I'm glad we're in, we're in fellowship together. I'm glad we fellowship one God together and worship one God. John 13th chapter a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. As I have loved you. I know it's been said and talked about many times that nobody can love you like Jesus does. Well, according to the teaching of the Word of God, if we don't have love, then we don't know God. So we've got to have love one for another. Let me finish reading this, this verse. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know 
that ye are my disciples if you have love one to another. You want to be recognized as a Christian? You want to be recognized as what you are really supposed to be? Then find that love one to the other. Amen. Have fellowship one with the other. Love one another. Amen. Then men and women will know, hey, there's something special about that group of people. It's been said many times in this church. I've heard many people comment about that's come and visited that this church is very friendly. It's very nice and very loving. And that's the way we want to represent ourselves to be. We want to love one another, not just among our collective selves, but let the love of God flow out of us into the community. Show love. Show compassion. Help people when you can help. But the best way to help anybody is to reach out and lend a hand of fellowship, lend a hand of love. And now you can give them money. You can... Uh, Give them rides to places you can do, do many different things, and that's okay. But the best thing you can do is show them the love of God through us. First John 1 and 4 said, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's chapter 4, verse 8. He that loveth not, he that loveth not knoweth not God. Let me tell you something about the Word of God. It'll tear you down just so it can build you back up. It'll make you what you need to be if you will take it to heart. Amen. It'll make you love your neighbor, love your enemy. It'll cause you to do things. Get out of here, bug. I don't want to eat you. Bug flying around up here. Excuse me. <laughs> he that loveth not knoweth not God. That's pretty harsh. You know, I, I've heard a lot of preachers preach, and I thought, man, he's pretty harsh. He's saying some pretty harsh things. But the Word of God, is, it can be harsh also. Because it tells you, you know, truth sometimes hurts. Doesn't it? Man, truth will hurt sometimes. It'll cause you, uh, you know, to realize, hey, you know, I, I'm not what I thought I was. Truth sometimes will hurt. 1 Peter 4 and 8 and 9 and 10, and above all things, having fervent charity among yourselves for charity shall cover the multitude of sin use hospitality one to another without grudging as every man have received the gift even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manif manifold grace of God now you know, Peter was talking here and he was talking about, he used the word charity. And many interpret the word charity to mean love. And that is true. But charity also means to be giving, to be uh, free hearted, to give, and, and, and without expecting to receive. Charity will build a platform of love or a bridge of love to people that don't know love. Is, does that make any sense? Man, love and compassion and concern will build a bridge to people's hearts that don't know that and have never experienced such things. We need to learn to express these things to our neighbors and our friends and our families. Amen. Romans 14, 19 said, Let us therefore follow after 
the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. In other words, if you've got an argument that you want me to argue with you about, forget it. I am after peace because peace and love go together. Amen. I'm not going to argue the point. There's many times that men have uh, wanted to argue about the Word of God, but the Word of God is not to be disputed. Not dispute, disputable. You do not argue the Word of God. The Word of God says what it says, and it means what it says. So if you've got an argument, you want to settle it out of just debating somebody in the Word of God. And, and I'm not condemning anybody that likes to debate the Word of God. Just go ahead and do it. And, but God help you and everything and all that. I love you. And you do what you got to do. But I'm here to tell you, the Word of God says it. I believe it. It's true. You're not going to change my mind by debating things with me and arguing with things, causing hard feelings about different things. The Word of God says it. And it's true. So let us follow after things which make for peace. In other words, follow the path of peace, not the path of hatred and arguments. And I'm going to refer back to the Verse of uh, John 15 and 13. Greater love, in my closing tonight, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Amen. God bless you tonight. Appreciate you giving me this opportunity to teach and uh, Hope that you got something out of it that would encourage you, help you. After all, we're not up here to discourage you. We're up here to encourage you. Man, we're all in this together. We're in one. one we're, we're all going to be part of the one body. So let's not try to be disruptive. Let's not try to be a part of the body that we're not. We all know what we are. God bless you tonight. Uh, I'm not up here to make no announcements, but I'm going to let you be dismissed. God bless you.